Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining today's session on accelerating sustainable value chains. On this issue, the challenge that lies before us is enormous. I read a report by BCG and HSBC which shows that nearly 80% of the planet's carbon emissions can be traced to global value chains. And then more than 90% of the firms in these <coughs> global value chains are actually SMEs. Now, many of these supply chains are actually led by MNCs, and that's part of the reason why it's important for us to listen to what our business leaders are going to be saying on this issue today. Research also shows that supply chain emissions are almost 11.4 times <clears throat> excuse me, higher than operational emissions. And there are additional complexities that we need to deal with, those of um, forced labor, uh, minimum wages that are paid, and workers working exceptionally long hours, which leads to health issues and other problems. So new ideas are really needed in terms of industry practice and policy cooperation to leverage value chains for sustainable development. Today, we are here to discuss what strategies, policies, and partnerships can help manufacturing companies accelerate the transition to sustain sustainable value chains. Joining me for today's discussion is Ms. Arancha gonzalez Laya, Dean of the Paris School of International Affairs, Institute Etude Politique, and former Executive Director of the International Trade Center. We have with us Mr. Ronald Bush, President and CEO of Siemens. Uh, we have Mr. Enrique Lorez, uh, President and CEO of HP. And of course, uh, Mr. Martin Lundstedt, President and CEO of Volvo. Between the three of them, we are going to be covering sectors that deal with several supply chain issues. So um, how about I begin with you, Arancha? Uh, before I begin, let me just remind everyone who signed on online that when you're communicating on social media, could you use the hashtag WEF22 in all your communications, please? So, Arancha, let me turn to you. You have a very rich experience in working on the sustainable trade and value chains with both public and private sectors. So what potential do you see to leverage value chains for sustainable development? Thank you very much, Shefali. Yes, uh, I mean, uh, I've seen this from, from both ends. I've seen this from the public sector, uh, from the regulatory side, let's say, at the international level, from the World Trade Organization, from the United Nations. But I've, I'm also seeing it uh, from the private sector. Uh, I advise uh, a company uh, that is uh, active um, in food markets, Danone, to in include, uh, as an independent advisor, to include uh, this sustainability criteria into the business operation. And for me, the biggest hit um, of this is the transformative impact that embedding sustainability into the business, the core business, can have not only for the companies, and I mean, I'm sure that the companies will speak about that themselves, uh, but also uh, for their suppliers, for the consumers, and for society at large. So what we have here is a possibility to transform the way in which our economy works, but doing it from the core of the business, not just as an afterthought, not just as a good to have, uh, but uh, as, um, uh, you know, from, from the point of view of businesses who understand that this can be a source of competitiveness uh, as well as uh, social goods. So that, I think, is what, uh, what the beginning of this conversation, I guess, is about. So based on the interactions you've been having with business leaders and all, what is the reality today? Is it still an afterthought and not really part of the core operations yet? No, I think... Um, if, I've look, if I look at the last 20 years, I think uh, this issue is, is moving uh, closer and closer to the core of the companies. And there are very few out there that now consider this as an afterthought. Mostly because considering it as an afterthought doesn't re deliver results. And in a world that is becoming much more transparent, uh, where transparency is a bigger requirement, whether within the company, with shareholders, and uh, you know, with the broader community, if you're not doing this uh, as the core of your business, it shows. And it just doesn't work. Got it. 
Uh, let me turn to our CEOs today and get their views on the issue. Um, uh, what I'd like to ask you is, why don't you share your information on the advances that are happening in your industry on this issue? Let me begin with you, Ron. Yeah, thank you. And, and just let me come back to, to the question we are talking about. Is Of course, sustainable supply chain is, is not only about using less, less energy, it's also using less resources. It's respecting local and labor law. It's contributing to societies. And of course, I mean, since COVID, we talk about it, uh, to make our supply chain more resilient. I do believe in the past, due to this um, labor arbitrage, um, going for cheap energy and, and the like, um, and anyhow, we don't have, don't have a CO2 price, so therefore maybe t uh, energy is artificial high. We, I always say we polish the asymptote of our supply chain. So it's just in time, just in sequence delivery for uh, automotive, for example. If something happens, I mean, you, you go to a full stop. And COVID showed us this is a hard way. And so therefore, that's something what we have to change. And there, actually for me, these are two elements. Of course, it's the strategy that you, that you think about your supply chain, how you, how you diversify it, um, allocate it to different regions, countries. But then I, I'm a strong believer in technology uh, to give an answer to that one. And it starts in the design phase, eco-robust design gives you, uh, from the very beginning, if you lose the right tools, it gives you a, what we call a digital twin of a product, including a digital twin of the footprint, so of the CO2 footprint. Is it recy recyclable? Um, and of course, you can also, in an eco-robust design, you would design in different, different suppliers. When we talk about complying the real and the digital world, because once you make it digital and you have a digital twin, then also of your manufacturing side, then you bring it to life, and then you control it also during, op during the operational phase, is the, is the output really what you, what you thought you would go in. Just one more word, uh, to make it more, more um, tangible, um, let's talk about our trains, our Mireo trains, commuter trains. We do that, we design them uh, virtually, we have a, a, a virtual image. They are using 25% less energy, they are recyclable to 95%, um, they are, they are um, you can power them with an overhead line, but also with hydrogen or batteries if you want. And th since we are running then in the operation phase with digital <coughs> um, AI, we can basically guarantee 100% availability because we know which part is going to fail and when and why. So you can pull them off, repair them and bring them back. This is very powerful. If you deploy that to our industries which are serving, I think it's, it's a very, very good answer to go mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm using less resources while still maintaining a higher growth, what I do believe we need. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. But in your industry, to what extent is this digital twin phenomenon happening? And what do you think is preventing companies from taking to it? I mean, as an idea, it sounds yeah. good. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to your answer too, but, <laughs> but I see th there's a strong demand. Um, and we see, and you see that if you talk about our software business, I mean, our software and digital business is a 5.5 billion growing with more than 10%, it's growing over proportional. So obviously the customers are asking mm -hmm. more for that. It's clear if you really want to maintain your productivity level, um, if you want to shorten your cycle time, there's no way other than going in this digital world and, and do whatever benefit you can get. The pickup rate so far is, can be even faster, and I think it's a combination of um, sometimes hesitating to invest, sometimes a lack of competencies, mm -hmm. uh, which brings me to one of the biggest topics which we have is mm -hmm. education and training of mm -hmm. people, because a job on a shop floor on a fully automated line co looks completely different than a job in a, in a semi or non-automated uh, line. Um, this includes also our software engineers. Um, they're using different tools which are go going way beyond just drawing, make a 3D drawing. No? You really simulate whatever it does when you shake it, when you heat it, when you, when you burn it, whatever, whatever, even the software running on a mm -hmm. hardware. Mm -hmm. So education and training. And then, and then last, last thing is, in most cases, when, when I see companies making a big step forward, it's driven on the, from the sea level. It's a visionary CEO who says, I want to go yeah. digital, I want to do that and then pull it off. Yeah, I, absolutely. I How is it about Volvo? Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> we are utilizing that uh, every day in the week, otherwise I, <laughs> I should have been given the wrong answer here. But uh, no, I, I will come back to it, actually. I'll come back to it. You can, you can continue right away, I mean, you know. Um, no, 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 but obviously for, for different reasons. I mean, both when it comes to the, the business models today where uh, we are moving from products 
and of the market services into solutions. And we need actually to replicate much quicker together with our customers and customers' customers. And that we are doing in, so to speak, the digital twin world to see, okay, how does it work yeah. before we are actually deploying different types of solutions. So both for our internal efficiency, uh, to shorten lead times, uh, quicker time to market on our traditional business, but I think more importantly for the whole transformation actually, because that gives you completely different opportunities to interact with downstream, our customers and customers' customers, but also very important for us uh, with, uh, as, uh, as you know, Roland, also a very complex and important innovative supply chain network uh, that gives uh, our ability to, to capture their innovation uh, force. So in your industry, which involves so many uh, firms, mm. I'm keen to know what are the advances that have happened in recent years that excite you beyond Digital Twin or you know, just... Uh, no, my, I mean, if, if you start with the bigger picture, as one of the world's biggest uh, provider of commercial vehicle and construction equipment solutions, right? Uh, of course, the big movement for us is uh, uh, the, all the positive effects about Paris. Mm -hmm and in particular the science-based target movements. And the reason for that is obviously that now companies are stepping up, talking about, okay, what is their CO2 footprint? Mm -hmm. How does it look like? Uh, what is the scope one, scope two, scope three? Uh, and uh, that is giving two very dynamic effects. First and foremost, we see that most sectors are coming pretty quick to transport mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and logistics and mm -hmm. infrastructure uh, and construction activities. And they're also coming to that by uh, understanding that in order to abate CO2, start with transport and logistics is a pretty good deal. Mm. Uh, if you're in retail, for example, maybe five, six percent of your cost is logistics, but 40, 45 percent of your footprint of CO2 is logistics. Yes, so if you can abate that by even increasing it with 20 percent, that will mean one percent of cost, uh, uh, one percentage of your total cost base, taking out 40 percent. It's a pretty good equation, right? And so, so that is by far the most important. That means that we are now connected. We have always talked about the ecosystem, but now the ecosystem is happening at scale because what is my scope three, and by the way, mm -hmm. that's 92% of my uh, footprint given I'm in supply, is someone else's scope one, scope two, or even scope three. Yes. So we need and we want to connect in this supply chain. And the other part of that that is so important is, is it's a bigger cause, because another very important part in the supply is supply of talent. And people, if you want to be in the coolest industry in the world, you should be in logistics and transport, okay? And that means also <laughs> that we are attracting a lot of talents. No, that's true. And, 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 no, that is true. And, and, and I mean, and, and the third thing about it is also that it is actually connecting different sectors. Yes, it is true. So, so I mean, what has been a traditionally extremely transactional industry, automotive and commercial yeah. vehicles, <laughs> you know, send out an RFQ and we don't want to have any opinions, <laughs> so you just answer to the RFQ request for quotation, has completely changed. I see for my, Andrea Fudor is my executive uh, when it comes to, to purchase and sourcing. I mean, the most important tool we have now is not the RFQ, it's the innovation dialogue. And why? Because we need to have all our supply chain partners along this line. But we can talk more about that later. Of course, yeah. Great time to yeah, have. Yeah, Enrique, yes, yeah. Enrique, I think that I would answer the question in a slightly <laughs> different way. I think that <laughs> what is most exciting about what is happening now is the fact that companies from almost every sector now have plans and have integrated sustainability as one of the key objectives. Each of us is doing it in a slightly different way because our businesses are different, but the definition of the problem is very similar. It's not only what energy do we use, exactly. it's how, our, how do we design our products, what materials do we use, where do we build our factories, what transportation, super cool technologies do we use, and this is really what has changed in the last year. And as we were talking before, the other important change is that in the past we were talking about goals for 2040, goals for 2050. The conversation has shifted now to what are we going to be doing next year? Mm -hmm. What is the plans that Volvo has to improve in the next 12 months? Yes. What is Siemens going to be doing in the next six months? What are we going to be doing immediately? That's what is, I think, important for the change. It's not a vision, it's things that are happening today. I agree. And here comes one interesting observation, um, talking about the timeline. Mm -hmm. um, was written recently in an, in an article, in a, and uh, out of whatever 160, 80 countries, maybe two of them are a little bit beyond 2030. 
almost all the others mm -hmm. are sitting on 2030 with their carbon zero target. Take the same picture for industries, any kind of small and medium sized company, big companies, all of them are targeting for 2030. So we are writing 2022 now, which is just eight years to go. As we are approaching 2030, I think we can all imagine what happens mm -hmm. because none of, none of them would really be n n uh, gross zero. You might be net zero. Mm -hmm. That means um, any kind of offsetting or whatever. This would be really a, a, a huge pile which we are building up. Right. I'm wondering how that goes. The answer is move now and move fast. Exactly. Yeah, yeah yes, absolutely. Exactly. exactly. Actually, tied to what you're just saying, um, I'm keen to ask you, like, um, you know, it has often taken a backseat, the whole push towards sustainability. But uh, can sustainability and competitiveness go hand in hand? It's a clear yes. And for us, it's business. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, um, it started off in, in being part of a report, mm -hmm. um, treated somehow <laughs> in the aftermath of our financial reporting. And it sits now in the core of, of, our, of our strategy. Um, talk about buildings. I mean, we are automating buildings, uh, building efficiency, and not only efficiency in automating them, but also making them um, using the full nine yards of technology which you have. Is it is it heat pump, uh, pumps? Is it photovoltaic on the rooftop? Is it storage? Um, um, connecting that to a, to a grid or even running it on a microgrid. Um, the, the trains I was talking about, but the whole industry. Yeah. I mean, at the firm time, they just talked about how, to, how can I pro produce productive. Now it's about how can I produce more sustainable. And uh, one of our customers, and, and, and we disclosed that, is uh, Mercedes. They decided to build in Berlin the most modern, most automated, and most sustainable uh, electric, electric car assembly plant in the world and have two Siemens because we go for the full nine yards. We, we, go, we go on the shop floor, we go for the buildings, and we also have an agreement to educate and train people, which is again a point which I believe uh, yeah, of cannot course. emphasize more. But uh, would this would would this also be true for small and medium scale companies? I think so. When I talk to them, they, they come back to us and ask us uh, also how can we support. It's very interesting. It starts really not in in saying okay I want to deploy a technology. It starts really I have to make a plan. I mean, and it starts even before that. I have to create transparency. Where where am I? You talked about uh, the, le the, the footprint, scope one and two. In our case, half a million tons. We are low energy intensive for, for Siemens. Cut it by half already since 2015. The supply chain, so scope three upstream, it's 20 times more. It's more than 10 million. Mm -hmm. So um, and you see that pattern all the way through, um, also for small and medium sized enterprises. So they want to create a transparency first. And once they have the transparency, then to make a proper plan to do that um, while and this is the point. I do not believe it's um, um, that you are you're impacting your competitiveness. I strongly believe you can increase your competitiveness at the same time. Enrique, may I ask you, like from your position, how much of visibility do you have in the supply chains that are working with you? I think it has become a, a critical need for all of us to understand our supply chains and understand the progress we are making. I think Arantxa said it very well at the beginning. We cannot manage this as a separate initiative. Mm -hmm. What most of, us, most of our companies have done, we are, have integrated sustainability as part of our business initiatives. It's not something separate mm -hmm. because we are all convinced that it is not an or, it's an and. We need to, to be competitive in the future. We need to lead in sustainability. We, for example, publish every year our sustainability report. We have in the report this year, we will share that in last year, we won more than $3 billion because of our sustainability practices. Mm. Mm -hmm. Because it's what Martin was saying, our scope three is the scope one for our customers. And they care about the sustainability programs we have because we'll impact their programs, they will impact their initiatives. And we are winning business just because of sustainability. And this is only starting, we are convinced that this is gonna be even more important in the future. Great, Martin, you were gonna say something. No, no, but, but I think also, uh, t just to add to what has been said here that I fully, I mean, uh, uh, support is also what we have learned during the, the last couple of years here. It's obviously, I mean, if you take uh, trucks, for example, I mean, that's uh, uh, made to measure built production equipment. It's not, a truck is not a truck, it's built for the specific purpose of the customer, right? That means enormous variety. It, m it means a, 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 fa a fantastic network of supply chain partners. 
and it's always the, the, the weakest link, regardless if you talk about the supply chain shortages that we have been facing now, short term, or if you think about the mid and long term execution of our strategy, right, that is a fossil free transportation system. Mm -hmm. And that is something that we have learned now that really continue to not only focus on the T1s, mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, the T2, the T3, both from a resilient point of view when it comes to visibility, volumes, you know, commitments where, where they feel on board, but also when it comes to sharing the visions, we can pull from the innovation capabilities of all these fantastic companies. I mean, we have a lot of SMEs, but they are sitting on huge capabilities when it comes to innovation power. Uh, and and uh, we have, for example, Camp X in Gothenburg, where we are sitting mixed with small, big uh, supply chain partners that can make a difference for us. So I think a lot of things have happened over the last, uh, not only related, because we relate everything to the pandemic and, and things like that, <laughs> but since we have understood that you cannot do it alone, this is a system gain. Yeah. We need to move from a brown to a green platform. And maybe want to add, and I do believe this, that the full transparency along the supply chain is a topic. Um, mm -hmm. It's a topic for big companies and for small and medium sized in particular. We, we used our software portfolio um, and we, we developed a, what we call Sea Green, which is an, 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 an extension um, to the supply chain. So which is a platform where all the data can feed in in order to really make it fully transparent for your developers. So that means whenever you are designing a part into it, as long as the data are coming in, then you see really what your footprint is. And, and, and I think it's also in the context with, with SWEF, we, we uh, brought a, a, to life Estenium, which is a community of, of companies who would feed in the data. Because if you have the data, then you, then you really better the days, of course. Um, and it's, it's not trivial, I tell you, it's not trivial. Think about a manufacturing, if, you, if we manufacture a PLC, What's the share of energy going to that very same PLC, a part of the whole energy consumption for plant? So you really have to think about it, how to do that. Once you have it, we have full transparency, and then you can attack. Right. On that point, Martin, um, you know, we've discussed digital twinning and um, related issues, but uh, is there a bigger role for technology to play in encouraging our push towards sustainable value chain? Of course, I mean, if without technology as a base, we will not uh, be able to do it both when it comes to the, so to speak, core technologies in the transformation, such as uh, uh, the whole electrification era, uh, both when it comes to battery electric execution in our industries, but also when it comes to hydrogen fuel cell, electric vehicles utilizing the same model or platform when it comes to powertrain. But then, of course, it will be a lot of digital layers coming into this, because in order to create, we are moving from as I said, to move from the brown to the green, uh, the, the trick here is really to move at the same time. Because otherwise it will be the chicken and the egg situation, right? <laughs> and now but this is the trick in when it comes to infrastructure, when it comes to uh, uh, certainty among customers, when it comes even to things, I mean, residual value, durability yes, for yes. the batteries, how long will they last, how should you think about it? Uh, and, and this will create an enormous network and very similar to what Roland mentioned about, I mean, the development phase, it will also be in the operational phase, right? Uh, and uh, here I think we should be more generous by sharing data also now as we speak, in, because that will allow us to move quicker and we will end up with much less uh, stranded assets because we do it together when it comes to moving the platform. Then we should continue to compete on the new platform. I think on the technology side, if I may, uh, there is also uh, the traceability of the value chains mm -hmm. uh, that need to be improved. And technology is a big means to do that. So what happens, I mean, the big problem that you all have, and maybe in your, in your industries is a little bit less of a problem because you have very tight control over your entire supply chain, whether it's tier one, tier two, tier three. But if I think of textiles, if I think of food, uh, which is much more atomized, the, trace, the technology will be essential to trace what's happening below the tier one and to make sure that you do not find, uh, take the food sector, that you've got uh, labor conditions in your chain that are not on the textile sector that are not uh, the standards that the company has uh, agreed to adhere to. So technology is a big part of the answer. And uh, what I think is good now, uh, frankly, but you will tell me whether you think otherwise, up until now, all of this was in the hands of the private sector. Mm -hmm. Private initiatives, private standards, multiplicity 
uh, that made your life very difficult because you didn't know really which standard to uh, re respond to uh, and to report to. Whereas now, at least in Europe, this is becoming public policy. Yeah. So you've got rules that everyone needs to adhere to. It's a bit more cumbersome, a bit more uh, probably uh, uh, puts a little bit more pain on your uh, quote unquote on your business, but it ensures a level playing field and greater transparency for all of you. So whether it's on traceability of value chains, whether it's on circularity, uh, whether it's on barcodes and the rest, the legislation that is coming out of the European Union, in my view, is now going to provide you with one set of rules and a better level playing field. Let, let, me, let me add to that, and, and I fully agree, the taxonomy which we are talking about is, is the right thing to do. I, I would give a little bit of a pre-warning because um, the grip on tier one is strong, on tier two is a little bit weaker. Tier yeah. three, yeah. I don't know whether you have full visibility, and if you go to the, uh, to the, to the mine, I, I, I think we lost, we, we are losing control. So therefore, and, and this is a big company, we have a, we have a lot of supply chain management people, I tell you. Small and medium-sized companies, if you really deploy the, the taxonomy full, full stop, full stream now, they do have a hard time to really comply completely with that. So I think it needs time to create mm -hmm. this transparency. And, and therefore, yes, the right thing to do, but respect the timeline you need, because once you're signing your report, um, I'm in control, mm. th then you might have a problem. And this is what we have to avoid. On the other side, on the other side, coming back to your point about integrity also of the supply chain. I mean, and, and you're fully right uh, when we talk about food and beverage. We, it's about from, from the farm to the fork to have an integrity, what happened to your food, not only in terms of CO2 footprint, but what lands on your table. Um, and, and this is something, we, we use blockchain technologies mm -hmm. to do that. Um, mm -hmm. It's one way, one answer to it. It's a massive, it's a massive trend, uh, you see that. Um, and and I do, which includes then everything. It's what is the water consumption related mm -hmm. to it? Um, what is the, what, what kind of fertilizer you used and whatnot? And and that's thing which you which which technology can help. But again, you have to deploy it in an end-to-end -end way, which makes it a little bit complicated once you think the whole thing through. And let's Agreed. hear from Enrique on this issue as well. Yeah, I, I think the point about reporting and transparency is fundamental, and it can be one of the biggest accelerators of change because it's one of the major obstacles we find today. We report in a way, Roland would report in a slightly different way, another company in a different place will do it differently. It is hard to see how everybody, what type of progress is each company making. Having clear standards and forcing us to use them is fundamental and actually something that from the public sector we have been pushing for. So we really welcome the help mm -hmm. from the public side. We wish there is some coordination between the European Union and the US and some of the big governments, because if not, it will be complicated, but it's really something needed that we will welcome because will help us really to make even more progress. I totally agree with you. You know, we need to have these standards, mm -hmm. you know, that all companies can buy and countries can buy into, yes. you know, because otherwise it, the trade becomes so much more complicated. But let me turn to you again, and let me ask you for your ideas on what kind of public-private cooperation would you like to see coming out of Davos or even in the future? I think the most important one is probably what we were just talking, aligning on in the definition of what are the standards that we need to use to report mm. and forcing every company of every industry to use those standards, to those that are relevant, of course, to make sure that we use them to be able to compare and to track progress. That will be such a, an important area that I don't want to ask for more. Let's make progress Absolutely. there. Absolutely, you know, I mean, there's so much of work to be done in this area. Yes. But Martin Roland, can I uh, draw your attention to this issue, like on public-private cooperation? Are there new initiatives that need to be taken? <coughs> of course, I mean, there are a, a lot of them, and, and I think uh, one that we are participating in, that is the first mover coalition, uh, that is how do we actually uh, focus on a number of very critical supply chains in order to create the prerequisites uh, in the private sector primarily, because it's a cooperation between uh, different companies. Uh, we are, for example, I mean, on the fossil free steel, we have seen good traction, but that will also require a lot of public, private, partnership when it comes to the speed as Roland was into here, eight years from now, 2030. And when we see a lot of the uh, enablers, uh, the, the political and, and the, the public arena is very important, permitting processes still being uh, done in a way that is coherent, obviously, with all the requirements. But, but today, it just takes too long time. And how do we cope with that in order? Because I think there is a great willingness, but and also we need also to integrate 
uh, sustainability efficiencies into the competition uh, law. Mm. Uh, because today it's only pricing efficiencies, which is good and important because we need to protect uh, the consumers. But we should protect the consumers also in a sustainable way. And sustainability efficiencies are required for industries to cooperate on standards to lift the industry into new platforms. And that is today also an area where uh, we have a number of processes ongoing for actually cooperation that takes too long time, basically. Yeah. We don't have the time uh, to wait for that uh, because we need to move. Yeah. Uh, 2030 is around the corner, and we need to start to uh, put sticks in the ground now. So, so there are, I think, more of that enabling factors than, uh, it's often a lot of talk about incentives and funding. I mean, you can have that for a short period of time. I'm not a big fan of that. I'm more fan of the enablers. It's something that's going to be very hard to do. But Ronald, quick thoughts on yeah, let, let, let but me, necessary. <laughs> let, let, yeah. let me add two dimensions. Uh, it's regulation and stimulation. Um, on the regulation side, I, I fully agree. I mean, we, we have to get in sync. I mean, it's, 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 it's cannot be that we are writing two reports, uh, one for, the, let's say, the US regulators and one the European ones. It's meaningless. But also coming back to the, the big discussion about CO2. And since we're at WEF, we want to s make a better planet. We have really joined forces. Um, and I mean, one CO2 price would be a global one, would be, yeah. would be a blessing because then you really, and, and then you can start lifting it and, yes. and, and find a way how to mm -hmm. live for it. So uh, it's dream, I know that, but, but actually we, we, should, we should have it in mind. Um, that makes it much easier, which brings me to stimulation. Stimulation, we, we know that also running through COVID, obviously governments are stimulating and, and this is great because um, all the stimulus money goes into the future, you know, in the past. Yet you have to do it right. And for me, one, one, one lesson I learned over the years is stimulating money works best if you do not put it on technologies, but if you put it in on outcome. I mean, what do you want to achieve? Um, is it, if you say you want to have a recyclability of whatever 95%, then go for that. And if you want to have a CO2 reduction, then just raise the price and, and stimulate, uh, could, could give money where we achieve that. Um, with one exception, if it's about new technologies, whatever you talk about, um, then we should, th there's of course a first phase where you really have to go into research, um, less, yeah. uh, less not near to the market, and there I do believe stimulus money has its, its justice. One last sentence and I come back to regulation, mm -hmm. data. If you over-regulate data, we have another problem, yeah. because we just talked about the whole thing goes about a, a yeah. fully, fully up, up the value chain and down the value chain integrity of data in order to create transparency. If you're putting hurdles on it and not, not to share it and because mm -hmm. it's so difficult, you have another problem. So I would be a little bit more easy on that, respecting privacy data. Um, yeah, I'm going to draw in Arancha on this point, oh, especially. No, think. <laughs> no, I mean, I think, uh, I think what we need now uh, is to put the regulators, not just of the EU and the US, but I would put the regulators in China and India mm -hmm. in the same room together with the businesses. Exactly. Because at the end of the day, uh, it's the businesses that need to tell the regulators, we do not want you uh, to have a multiplicity yeah. of regulatory frameworks. Give us one, whichever you want, but give us one. Uh, I think uh, uh, the WEF has spent a lot of time uh, putting the businesses around the table to discuss private standards. But now what we need is the public and the private, all the big guys, uh, if you can get a, a, some of the smaller ones too, because part of uh, the mines, et cetera, that you described are also in parts of the world that need to be around the table. One regulatory framework, regulatory convergence, that's uh, a bit uh, the name of the game. And um, the sooner the better, because you know we set 2030 as the, the magic date uh, for achieving results, but now we know from the last IPCC report that two, 2030 is already late. Mm. So uh, back to your point, accelerating efforts is what we need and I think what we need is frameworks that would allow for this acceleration to take place in a cooperative manner. <laughs> one of the themes and I learned here, uh, if you allow me, uh, one of the themes here has been deglobalization and the risk of fragmentation. True. And I guess from what you've heard this morning, Thus is the thing to avoid the most. Okay. Because uh, what I hear you say is that you've got your value chains all across the world. So we don't need a fragmentation. What we need is greater coherence, greater coming together. Um, 
Uh, okay, sure, Martin wants to. No, no, I, I fully support this. I think this is so important to underline. We have learned a lot about resilience, that we need to reinforce regional value chains for good reasons. It will also come uh, with uh, the, the price on carbon and a lot of different factors. But to continue to allow for a, a global uh, supply chains, uh, both for innovation uh, and for, for really executing uh, on the borderless a uh, challenge we have together on, on climate and biodiversity. We must continue to do so. And one thing that I've been a little bit afraid of during this uh, World Economic Forum is that we have forgotten open in strategic autonomy. Mm. Yes. Uh, and for me, open strategic autonomy mm -hmm. is a well-balanced phrase mm -hmm. because we understand that different regions need uh, strategic autonomy in different shapes and forms. But the openness must be underlined in every conversation to your point. So I just wanted yeah. to support that. And, and if I may, I think the, the way globalization has been designed for, defined for the last 10 years, I think it's gonna be changing in the next five. And I think this is actually an opportunity from a sustainability perspective. Mm -hmm. Because at the same time, we are gonna be redesigning our value chains to be more resilient, which is something that mm. we have learned during the last two years that we have to do, because in some areas we have exposures that, that we shouldn't have. Redesigning them is the opportunity to make them more sustainable as well. And the definition of globalization might be different, but this is a big opportunity we have now in the next years to really accelerate some of the changes that we have to do. Arancha? Well, well, one more point, and, uh, because you mentioned the strategic autonomy. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit reluctant to use this autonomy word, so I would underline and bold phase strategic. <laughs> Meaning it's, on, it's only in those areas where you really need to have, a, have a, are vulnerable, where you should target for agree. autonomy. Yeah. Other than that, yeah. it's, 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 it's completely, it's exactly, this yeah. open, uh, yeah. is, for me, it's, the point is there, I mean, mm. look about Germany, for example. Um, we, are, we will be forever, if you don't go for fusion or whatever, we will, we will forever be an import, energy import country, full stop. So how can we be autonomous? Mm -hmm. There are uh, food import countries. Middle East is, is one of the largest food importers. They cannot be autonomy. So therefore, it's more the open and strategic part which is important then. And I, I think they're fully in line here. Yeah, but I'm also globalization is all about cooperation and collaboration. Mm -hmm. But let me turn to Arancha. Beyond regulation, do you see a bigger role for governments in this particular area? Look, I think governments have to set the right incentive schemes. Uh, that, that's what governments are about. They are not uh, about telling businesses how they, they run their businesses. Uh, they are about setting the regulatory schemes, setting the incentive schemes, uh, whether it's on the taxation, whether it's on the education. I very much agree with you that we've got a huge issue. Many of the value chains uh, will require skills that we are not producing today and this are not producing today at the scale that will be needed. And that's where governments uh, can be of enormous uh, help working with businesses. Um, so set the frame, set the right uh, set of incentives. That's the role of governments. And then the rest is, uh, and uh, transparency and accountability, you know? Uh, then uh, you let businesses run, accountability, transparency, uh, so that uh, everybody knows what's going on. I guess that's, uh, you know, that's let, the me, let, me, let me add one, one subject to that one. Um, well there's there's one, one exception, I would say, where, where I, would, I would require government to also um, um, get into the boat. It's if, it's if it's about securing critical supplies, I mean, rare earth, mm. cobalt, nickel, whatever. Um, even if co companies coming together, um, the, maybe others have 11 players or 12 players on the field and we have only 10. Um, so the government would be a very well welcome because the reason why I'm saying that this is a very, very long-term strategy in order to supply, and I guess you, you, you know Absolutely. what I'm talking about. So joining forces here and also get a government engaged because and very often it's about government, government relationships when you want to make a whatever, 20, 30 years mm -hmm. agreement on how to get access to certain um, critical Absolutely. Commodities. I'm just going to try and see if I can squeeze in a question or two from our audience here. Anyone? Okay. Please identify yourself. Hello, Dan Biederman. I'm a social entrepreneur within the Schwab community and have worked on traceability and supply chains for a long time, including with HP. Um, what a joy to see CEOs talking about the need for regulation to level the playing field. It's, it's something civil society has certainly been talking about for a long time. 
one of the obstacles to faster, quicker, and more complete progress is your competitors. So you're all leaders. How are you going to bring the industry along? Who would like to go first? I think this is where government help is necessary. If there are clear standards that everybody needs to report to, it's not a matter of whether we do it and our competitor doesn't. This is why the definition of those standards is so critical. And if the standards are the same in every country or similar, even better to really accelerate the, the reporting. And I think one example on that that we have been uh, engaged in that I think is uh, just one very concrete example is, for example, the Global Battery Alliance and the Battery Passport. How can we make a standard out about uh, the ut utilizing the digital capability to follow the supply chain, both when it comes to all dimensions of sustainability, ethical, social, uh, environmental, and, and economically distributed well? Uh, is an initiative that I think is absolutely necessary, not only for that supply chain, but, but that is very critical now since it's accelerating very quickly. So these type of initiatives and uh, getting more and more on board, obviously. Yeah. Uh, we talked very much about, and I, I'm a strong believer in, in technologies, as you recognized already, <laughs> um, uh, deploying new technologies. Um, the, and I mean the whole technology stack, uh, from the sensors over the edge to the cloud, which is, uh, which is combining the real and digital world, um, is, is for me the answer. I mean, you can take every industry up and down. Yet. Along with that goes a change in mindset of, of how we define competition. And I'm about now to talk about the economy of platforms, uh, multi-sided platforms. The more you give in, the better it may you get out. And the more player you have, the more you get. Our business managers, they run businesses in a, in, in a very clear way. Three at T, tier three delivers to tier two, to tier one, to OM, and, and you to the customer. And everybody adds value, and, and this is how it goes. This breaks up. It will be a network. It will be multi-sided platforms. Mm -hmm. That includes competitors playing on a platform. Unfortunately, not all of our customers are using only Siemens PLCs. Still, we have to connect them to our solutions. Mm -hmm. So if we don't get them on board, we have another topic. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit more open from that perspective. If, if, if you really want to pull it and, 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 and scale and go fast, going fast, talking about 2030, uh, there's no way around uh, how to redefine also our business model, also in the context of competition. I want to uh, go back to uh, what Enrique was saying a minute ago. Uh, yes, we are in a new phase of globalization. Um, globalization was understood to be openness without many rules. And what we know now know is that openness is a requirement, but that you need more rules of the game. And what is good now of this phase of globalization, at least from where I sit, is that we put these rules clearly on the map. Sustainability rules, uh, rules uh, to protect uh, basic human rights, labor rights, um, rules to make sure that uh, we've got more resilience, resilience in countries, resilience in businesses. So this is the new phase of globalization. So it's not less globalization, it's a globalization that is adapted to the times we're living where we need also values embedded in business. We have just a few minutes left. Uh, do you think I can allow my panelists to say their final words? I'm sorry. <laughs> so Martin, um, uh, in 30 seconds, like what action can our global community take to accelerate sustainable value chains? 30 seconds. <coughs> First and foremost, I mean that we have this conversation accelerated. I think it's a very good sign uh, talking about all the opportunities we have with technology, but also that at the end of the day, it's about uh, people sharing values where we want to go, utilizing those uh, enablers. So partnership is the new leadership. I, I strongly believe in that. And I think there are a number of tangible initiatives coming out from a forum like this. Uh, again, I would like to advocate for the first mover coalition. I think it's a great initiative. It's concrete in different sectors. Uh, so, so please, you're the shift is the new leadership. Mm? Enrique. I think it's, it's about action. We all have plans for the next 10 years. Now it's about what are we going to do, <coughs> sorry, in 22, in 23, in 24, and really make sure that we use our, our companies as platforms because we can do a lot of things internally, but we can be even more influential by influencing our suppliers, governments, and I think this is where change can really happen. Absolutely, action and you know, driving the change, especially making your companies the platforms. Radeln? 
Well, I, I think the problem description is there. Um, CO2 footprint, climate change, uh, food supply, uh, water shortage, and you name it. Um, and, uh, and actually, technology brought us to the point where we are today. But it was not all bad, because we are living in a world where we are feeding almost 8, 8 million people, and they are the, the portion of people who are living in, in poverty is lower than ever. Mm -hmm. So there's a good news, too. However, going forward, in order to make that not worse, technology will be able, it brought us down to the point where we are, and will get us out. Technology is the answer. Arantxa, for you. <laughs> So we are at the turning point, uh, but we've got an opportunity uh, to craft a new system uh, that works on the basis of openness, more resilience, uh, and works for all, for people and for planet, but also for prosperity. So that's the challenge. We can do it. I, uh, to use the words of, uh, of a famous uh, German, we are schaffing das. We need it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your comments. I think today's discussion was fascinating. There's a lot of work still to be done. I think sustainability has to start figuring in trade discussions. It has to start figuring in all the investment decisions that are being taken, just so that all of us can work together and push for a um, better future for all of us. Thank you so much for joining in today.